So yeah, just as, as Jane said, I'm Seb Cunningham, Team Leader Social Policy and Planning, responsible for demographics and social data, health and social policy at the City of Casey. And Janet, as, as Jane said, Head of Community Facility Management, really sets the direction and operations of 44 community facilities across Casey. So lots of experience with environments of social connection. Dueling computers here. I just want to say what a wonderful um, welcome this morning from Perry. Uh, we would also like to pay our respects to the traditional owners of these lands, as well as Casey's Bunurong and Boonwurrung uh, peoples. Our gathering place in Dubton supports local connection for our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. So great to hear something similar is happening here in Whittleson. I also want to highlight Casey's diversity statement, which is read before each council meeting. Both these statements are reminders of our commitments and responsibilities to our diverse communities. The changes we have undergone, mistakes we've undoubtedly made, and the need to authentically and purposely check in with community to ensure we understand their evolving aspirations, strengths, and challenges. What we're presenting today is a bit of a journey as a council partner in the research. How our role and community expectations have changed in relation to social connection, some green shoots of activity in the space, and what we see as our evolving role and potential. So we in local government are the closest level of government to people and communities, you might have heard that said before. Does this closeness bring about special local knowledge or capabilities where social connection is concerned? Well, sort of, maybe not really. Directly or indirectly, much of what we do does involve social connection, from planning and building various infrastructure to programs and events. We envision our spaces and places as bustling centres of activity where people meet and connect. But our true impact in making social connection happen has always been imprecise ill-defined or elusive, with limited insight into how it actually happens. This is because social connection is so often a byproduct of what we do, a vague concept left unpacked, and that's what the research is really addressing. In my space in social data, for instance, you know, how do we track social connection in our communities? At the population level, we typically rely on the use of proxy measures such as volunteer rates and feelings of trust and safety without any system or framework to really determine what it all means. At the program level, we count attendance, monitor foot traffic through smart technologies, and evaluate community satisfaction through inconsistent survey models. These are the inadequate tools we have to measure our impact, tools that reflect our limited understanding of something so fundamental to our work. But the strength and quality of connections made as part of our work in local government can be profound for our community. For example, my wife and I recently first-time parents. Attending a new parent group as part of the Maternal Child Health Service, my wife has formed what appears to be a long-term local friend, which is an amazing outcome. But how do we capture these positive outcomes, build on and borrow from them in other contexts and capture the true social value to which we contribute? These are some of the initial questions that we pondered when the research partnership was proposed. So Milivan's just gone over this, so you're well familiar with this, but looking at the social, at the connection framework from the research, council largely works in the outer circles of, of connection, primarily in the micro communities and wider communities. We create the supportive environments such as community hubs, open spaces, playgrounds, facilitate activities, programs, events, and support groups with grants and training to create the conditions and potential for connection. We hope some closer relationships develop and endure as a result of our efforts. We hope some of these closer connections then result in the local establishment of new community groups and projects where leaders and connectors organize people and make exciting things happen, but we don't know for sure it will happen. In the past, many of our community initiatives were led by community and there was a sense in which the, trad the traditional model just worked, build it and they will come, put on an activity or event, support a community group to establish itself and it just seemed to work. People needed only a little help to get started, but things are different now. Over the last few years, we've seen a shift. What does that shift look like across Casey? These will not be unfamiliar to you and some have been mentioned already. Um, in Casey, we're experiencing declining rates of volunteering and local committee participation. This means the work of connection is left to fewer and fewer community connectors and increasingly falls on paid staff trying to fill the void. And is that something we really want? Increasing rates of psychological distress bring reduced confidence and motivation to connect. Increasing financial pressures result in fewer resources to attend paid for activities, whether through reduced time as people are working more or reduced discretionary budgets for participation and travel requirements. The huge increase in cultural diversity 
um, in case he brings new community expectations, sometimes com competing expectations and aspirations, which we, ne we need to cater for. And of course, an aging population brings with it mobility and access barriers. These trends across the municipality are broadly reflected in the individual experiences outlined in the research captured here as common barriers. And of course, our growth. Whilst all our suburbs are changing, our growth areas bring about unique challenges. New urban developments are starting from scratch, complete from the ground up in terms of connection. So much is expected within these rapidly growing areas. These communities have high rates of long commuting for work, services and connection and now high rates of mortgage stress. At present, our growth areas account for around a quarter of the Casey population, around 95,000 people. And this is forecast to double over the next decade. This rapid social change brings risks of disharmony and disconnection. As was mentioned earlier, we are often retrofitting social connection into these new suburbs. And the importance of neighborhood houses and community houses is, is I totally, totally caught that. Um, within our growth areas, often they're, they're simply not established. And whilst we respond head on earnestly through various programs with dedicated staff, these are significant challenges for growth area councils to resolve. We're already seeing these changes and grappling with them. Then came 2020 and COVID-19 really forced us to change thinking, priorities and approaches. It created the space for thinking about and testing innovative ways of connecting people, particularly those who might be more at risk of isolation during that period. These are some of the projects that came out of this period, but I want to just mention just one so I don't get uh, wound up. The Get Connected program was developed to support older people with connection. From our perspective, those at most immediate risk of isolation during the lockdown period were our older people who were receiving in-home care. Many have mobility issues and difficulties completing household tasks. The key pivot here was redeploying our team of direct care staff who re routinely visit these community members. They would, instead of performing their routine duties, provide digital assistance to older people to connect with family and friends. In this new context, social connection became the priority over lesser immediate needs. Hundreds of hours of support and connection were provided during this difficult period. And whilst that pilot model was ultimately unsustainable long-term, it provided the impetus for new projects that centered on connection as an end in itself. We were enabling community members to continue their close relationships playing in that inner circles in a way we hadn't done before. In the aftermath of COVID-19, this momentum has persisted both within local government and across communities. A growing recognition that understanding and enabling social connection is more important than ever. Thanks, Seb. There's so much in all of that, isn't it? The data is all telling a story. And it's interesting, but we noticed as a council, there was a shift in community as well. The data was saying stuff or experiences, but you know, each year or every four years, council goes out to community and asks, what's your vision for Casey, your 10 year vision for your community? And um, you guys, have you all done that? Of course you all participate in your local council, don't you? Okay. Yes. I'm watching you. Um, so, and in the past, we, you know, you'd always hear things like more roads and safer parks and make the city cleaner. You'd hear a lot about infrastructure. But when we went out in 2022, we heard something different. For the first time, we were hearing lots of um, people narrative was community spirit, sense of belonging, help us connect. There was a shift going on. And we hadn't heard that in the way that we were hearing it this time. So Casey wide, we were hearing these sentiments and I'm terrible at following these things. Uh, ooh, ooh. Yeah, okay. So Casey wide, we were hearing that. And for us on the ground, as Seb mentioned, um, I work with the team and we look after 44 community centers. So that can be large hubs or family and community centers that have like maternal child health and kinders and senior sits and public halls. And we go out every year and ask, what would you like to see out of your community center? And in the past, same thing. The narrative would be yoga classes, fitness classes, English classes, very much centered on the individual and what they might want for you know, their activities, a long list of wish lists. But this time when we went out last year, we did this in July, August, 
same thing. There was a different sentiment. We were hearing things where people were saying, we don't actually care what you do. Just do something where we have to connect again because we're lonely and we're scared and we need help in reconnecting. You can see some of the comments. that and It's the first time I've seen that. Um, and I've been doing this a, a little while. It wasn't a wish list anymore. It was suddenly, please, we recognize as a community, we need to get together again. We need social connection. Amazing, hey. And for us, it began to really, we, I think we have a moment in time. I really do, right now. Since COVID, community are recognizing it. They've got to um, be part of it. We almost have a blank canvas is how I'm feeling because there was a stop in the way things were. COVID, we have a chance to rebuild in a new way. And if we're not smart, <laughs> we're just going to go back to the old. And something I've noticed completely is what we've all heard, heard today. Volunteering is down and our traditional structures, though, of how we support community is very much based on a structure I think is from the 70s. Volunteering looks like this, and in order to have thriving groups, you need this many volunteers, but we're not getting those volunteers. I don't know if you're noticing that, but we're struggling. We're struggling to get people on committees of management. We're getting um, facilities handed back that, that used to be facilities that community groups ran and looked after and had vibrant programming. They're actually saying, council, we can't do this anymore. So what are we gonna do? And that's been a big part for us as a, a council is, what are we gonna do to face that and help build this? So we've been doing a bit of a shit. How am I going? Good time, yeah, who cares? Um, um, so what we've done, um, is we really, um, council in the past has also looked at their facilities kind of according to the asset. You know, we, we just look at it as a building. And I've been really passionate about how are the people engaged in that building? And sometimes, oh, whatever. So I think we, um, I was really been thinking about this for a long time. It's, I don't know if the building's as important as the way people are connecting in the buildings. And I've worked in some really old, terrible buildings but they're full of life and thriving. And what that was is there was a sense of ownership, a sense of belonging and a sense of connection in those spaces and places. So for us, one of the things we did is we moved from just looking to being all KCY, but moving into what we call local area planning. A lot of you would know what local area modeling is. It's nothing new. But for us as a teams, we've kind of now broken into the local because again, often we try and apply one solution to an entire area, but they have different needs, different identities, different cultures. So for us, knowing that in Doveton, gonna have a much different response to what they want out of social connection than maybe the growth corridor, who are very time poor, traveling a lot. We can't apply the same brush to the whole area. So that's one thing we've really been doing. And the other thing we've really been looking at, I don't even know where I am in spaces and places, but um, is, looking at our actual facilities, I have heard a lot today about informal spaces. So how we can turn our foyers, if you're in the growth quarter, there might not be a library that's near you. There is no place you can go. So how do I, in my community centers, create informal spaces where you can treat it like a library? What do we love about a library? Is you can come and you don't have to justify why you're there. You just get to be. And even if you're an introvert, you can hang out with people, but not really talk to them. That could be a good thing, huh? But if you are an extrovert, you can talk to people. And we need to create these spaces. That's something we're really focusing on. How can we create in our local way, little spaces and places that can become community hubs? We can create those opportunities. We've done things like turn our foyers into that's a, a foyer, one of our community centers during school holidays, we just put tables of activities and just see if people will come in and they start connecting themselves. All we've done is create the space and the place. And sometimes I have to admit, we've needed staff to go, hey, Barbara, have you met Susan? That one introduction and off they go, you know, creating these places that can cause, what did you call bumping in together? I love that. I actually used it in, I know I combined things. Um, so that's some of the work we've been doing. The fabulous Mandy Neve is gonna talk about on a local level, what it was to, to, to be working in a co-design space of activating a center. One of the things we've done in the growth corridor is we partnered with a developer and they've actually given us a house um, as early infrastructure that's acting as a community center. 
So they've provided that to us. And it literally is a house, which used to be what neighborhood houses looked like. And that's early. So we have early infrastructure in there. Really exciting. And Mandy's going to talk a lot about what that's an evolving um, site looks like. So co-design, engagement, um, really looking on a local level are some of all the things for us as a local council. We know it's going to look different. That's all I know. It isn't the same structure that we had in the 70s of volunteering. We have, it's, there's new things happening and we're hungry to find out what it is. How do we engage community in a new way? Um, I, one note I'll put is I think one of our things is we professionalized community. If you look at your groups, I love we're talking about volunteering, but I have community members who go, I've tried to volunteer, Janet. <laughs> I can't get in. I have to fill in 20 pages. I have to have, we make more barriers than we need to. So I challenge us to look at the very systems that we, even as organizations, are we making it easy for people to volunteer? We're telling everyone else, but are, is it easy? How do we um, break down some of the barriers that we have. If you want to come and hold a space at council, let's say, and do a knitting group, well, are you incorporated? Do you have public liability? We, it's like, I just want to knit. Like, what are we doing? We've got to challenge the systems because we're, we're really creating more um, barriers for people to participate. And I think it's our job to challenge those systems. I think it's our job to challenge our bureaucracy even. And I'm speaking from a bureaucracy and I'm really proud of Casey because we're hungry to see a change because we know we have a moment in time to really see a shift and do things differently. <laughs> Thanks, Janet, just to put a bow on this. Um, so I guess local government's role, um, you know, we really see it as multidimensional, always evolving, but manageable. And we see the great potential in what we've started thus far. And the research partnership will really support with key elements of the work that we are missing. In terms of our role, we must position social connection as a clear and measurable strategic objective that council departments and partners organize around. And at its foundation, a shared measurement framework which has been discussed before, part of a system to improve what has already been mentioned. We must support partners to align around this shared framework, providing an opportunity to highlight the extended value of what they deliver to community. We must monitor data and respond to the local conditions that speak to social connection. A health and wellbeing household survey will be undertaken to capture new social connection data developed through the research, providing the opportunity to monitor connection across local areas and share findings across the organ with partners. We must empower community connectors and groups to lead and design local activations in their neighbourhoods with seed funding and resources, as Janet spoke to, and remove that red tape, of course. We must scale up good practice by identifying program and service models that are highly affected, effective at creating connection. And we must share information about social opportunities to link community with activities and activities with community. To this end, we are currently piloting a social prescribing model as part of our Living and Aging Well Action Plan. So in closing, next steps, um, we're really just going to be continuing to embed the elements um, that the re research um, gives us and progress this into planning, strategy and policy. How we bring strategic and urban planners along this journey will be critical to our, our success in the next phases. Through the research findings and outputs, we intend to adopt an org-wide approach and commitment to social connection, where connection is not an assumed byproduct of doing other stuff, but an intentional key strategy, core function, and measure of success. Thanks a lot. So questions, questions from the floor. We can take a few. So, oh, there is a few. So we've got one, two, and I think three there, and four. Excellent. Hi, uh, Ben Shaw um, from Swinburne. Um, one of the questions I had about LGAs, uh, I guess one of the interesting characteristics of a council is that it has a boundary um, and that that doesn't often sort of intersect with human boundaries around how they live their lives. So you guys can do some fantastic stuff, um, but if I live three metres away from the city of Casey, I'm not a beneficiary of it. I guess I'm just wondering what sort of, um, what are the challenges or, or maybe opportunities that you have around working, you know, across other councils and, and sharing learnings and knowledge and stuff um, to sort of break some of those barriers? Well, it's, I, hello, you don't, um, I, I don't think we as workers on the ground care that much about boundaries. We'll take anyone, let's face it. Um, and because we know life is, isn't a boundary thing. And um, for Casey, particularly 
they have to go somewhere else to get services because there are none. <laughs> you know, so for us, we're not as much, but we also are working hard at our relationships cross culture. We could do better though. Partnerships is a big one, which I forgot to mention because that's, I think, an area we've really wanted to grow in because often not just that, like across LGAs, in our very community, another organization be doing an amazing work and we go start the same work because we never, never thought, oh, we could do it together. So we're trying to break that down because we work silos um, and, and from a local area, that's one of the moves for us is looking at a local area and saying, who's here in this space? What are the strengths of the community? What's already happening and how do we all work together and almost forming a network um, much more holistically. And that's been a shift for us at council because we do stay very siloed in our departments, much less um, in our um, partnerships with other community organizations and humans. And I mean, you know, this research project is an example of, you know, us working in partnership across three different similar LGAs, I suppose. And you'll see uh, more regional work locally with Greater Dandenong for us and Cardinia. Um, more and more, we are recognising the need to, to work together um, and share resources. Yeah, and I've got a question uh, down at the front here. I think there was another person at the back as well. Yep, so we'll take this one first. Uh, hello, my name's Raina Ogren. I work at Bolton Clark and we're doing a Connect Local Social Connection program in Glen Ira. Uh, my question is around um, the social infrastructure and um, councils have town planners. Um, they actually can enable organ uh, communities to be built in a way that supports connection. Those 20-minute cities are an amazing thing. Um, the deserts of the suburbia actually are cause a lot of the issues in terms of lacking social connection, but are also wasteful in terms of all the infrastructure costs that are needed for that. So are council considering a much more concerted whole of council uh, focus on well-being with social connection in mind in terms of town planning and all of those other things that are needed for that? Uh, in short, yes. Um, we've been grappling with 20-minute neighbourhood cities um, for a while now, I suppose. It's kind of a bit of a it's, it's kind of bounced around, I guess, different departments um, because it's really challenging in such a large municipality. Um, how do you create 20 minute cities uh, within Casey, within growth areas? Um, it, it, it's not straightforward, but it is certainly something that we are um, trying to embed in, in our own way, in our local way, I suppose. Um, something we're doing as part of our Living and Aging Well Action Plan is to, um, do the best we can in terms of getting older people to be more connected to local facilities and social infrastructure. Um, but it's a, a continuing, I, I guess, battle and um, challenge. Some interesting research. Um, if you look at um, an example, Salandra Community Hub was a, a an early um, response to that. And I can get you the paper for it because it talks about uh, they were doing a testing model of early infrastructure for health, particularly people commuting long points. So there is some a lot of research in there, but we have to change our like we did this. And then you think, is anyone else doing it? Like we do great things, don't we? And then it's just a pilot that goes into, I don't know, pilot land. So, <laughs> you know, we, we got to change again. We, we so are drawn back to old systems because we know them. The blueprints are there, aren't we? Change is hard. It's so hard. So keep having the conversations, keep challenging, I think is important as well. Challenging and forcing that is good. True. Now we had a question in the middle. If you don't mind the speaker there, just hold for that moment and take the mic, but we might take one question uh, from online as well. Yeah, sure. Um, there is a great question about TikTok, Milvan. I know that's your favorite subject, but I'm not going for that one. Um <laughs> Milivan, you mentioned does the online, uh, you mentioned online linking with like-minded people. Does that translate to face-to-face -face connection? Yes and no. No? Yes? Okay, this one is better. Um, yeah, that's a good question. Sometimes it does, sometimes it does not. So there are people who just prefer connecting online with certain groups. And I mean, the answer could be depends what the person who is connecting online wants and desires. So in the research, we heard about people who are having uh, 
uh, who found good, like even like they are, so when we were using the circles of connection, they were re like referencing, which is not something that we, we hear very often, like people were referencing uh, in their most inner circle were people that they're exclusively connecting online. And what is more, those people are residing overseas. So they actually never had in-person connection, but they consider them uh, the, 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 the closest uh, to them. And they don't even like feel like there is something missing. So I'm not, I mean, obviously I can't speak on behalf of this particular person, but like uh, to me, it looks like they wouldn't necessarily uh, want to move it online they are just like fully enjoying uh, the 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 online form of connection uh, uh, with those particular people but then there was people who who would have a mix of people so they are having close connections with in a physical world but then they also have the people that they met online and mostly connect uh, through online and i think it was interesting uh, that one participant saying that it gives them a completely different perspective. So they have almost like a neutral voice, someone who is not uh, connected with these other friends. So is having like a, a clearer perspective, which is what they want. And like that's social connection need that they kind of uh, fulfilled online and they just prefer it. So yes, I guess back to the question, does it move? Uh, I guess it can, but it doesn't have to. It all depends what the person who is using digital uh, wants to achieve. Thank you. And thank you for your patience. Over to you on the floor. Yes. Hi, I'm Jackie. I've got a question. I don't know if you guys might be able to answer, but for me, representation matters. So um, what role do you see council in playing in recruiting a diverse workforce? So it's quite daunting to go to a local government where I don't see somebody that looks like me or at the, um, for young people, um, they want to speak to a youth worker that looks like them, have had the same experience as them and to like understand the kind of services that council provide. Um, what role do you see council playing in that? Because um, council is one of the biggest like employer within like any area. Um, so that's my question. Yeah, it's a really good question um, and something we've definitely been working on for a number of years. Um, but quite honestly, we started from a long way back. Um, an example, you know, when I started our staff data, the, the background data we collect from staff, um, we didn't have any. Um, so we couldn't even tell you if our workforce was diverse. Um, anecdotally, we could make some assumptions, but that's the reality. So we're doing a lot better now. Um, we're recruiting, I guess, diverse candidates from across a range of cultural backgrounds and socioeconomic backgrounds. Um, we've just started a Future You pilot, um, which um, supports... Uh, job seekers who've found it challenging to re-enter the workforce, particularly older people. Um, I have one starting in my team next week, actually, which is fantastic. You as well? Yep. Well, they're everywhere. Um, so, yeah, we are doing some fantastic things now. And, look, I, I, I have actually seen the change in diversity um, over the last four years at my time at Casey. So small steps, I suppose, is the answer, um, but improvements are being made. And one thing we've also seen, we ran a community leadership program for the first time because we don't actually have counselors at the moment. So four years. And what is exciting is investing in community leaders that we hope will um, even become counselors and seeing the age, women, all different backgrounds. And really, we focused hard at we want a representation of our community, not just the same people signing up. And the team, that was a focus. They were passionate about going to places that you don't always go to because you often get the same voices, don't you, all the time. And yeah. Oh, you know. um, so um, I, he was doing this under the table, people. You can't see it. Um, but that, so I'm, I'm I am, that's like Seb said, we've really um, made an effort and that's one of the keys, isn't it? To get diversity, you just don't go to the same place, you know, but you got to look in different places because it's, it's new. It's different. Apologies, Jen. I was trying to, I'm used to <laughs> I, was, it, trust me. I was trying to get Jane's attention. I think there's one more question online. Is that right? All right. We've probably got time for one. Yeah. But the challenge is transport and getting people there particularly in multicultural communities and older people who may have to drive. Any suggestions on, on how to get local government to tackle this, on how local government can tackle this? 
Uh, it's interesting. And there's some thoughts to that because one, one thing we noticed with COVID is the shift, more people are working from home. So yes, in the growth quarter, but the 20 minute neighborhood, we're actually trying to get people that they don't have to travel. We got to get them connected locally again. So um, we're, we're trying to work on that more so because I think what's happened is certain places all got the focus and maybe the attention and some of the outer ones didn't. We, we, we're doing some work on that ourselves is how do we actually create um, hubs that you can't, you don't need transport and people are working from home. So we're creating spaces now. One of the things we're trying is um, creating like little business hubs where um, you can get out of the house and just come work in our little community center um, and talk to someone or have a meeting. Cause you don't want to do it in your home or get away from the kids who keep walking in your zoom meeting. Um, we're trying, that's something we're testing now on, on trying to create ways so yes, I think transport and Casey, I, I can't solve the, we have a huge issue with that, but what we can tackle is now maybe creating local spaces that are actually worth getting to and coming to. Mm -hmm.